This is Hollywood and CBS presenting forecast number four. Herbert Marshall, directed by Alfred Hitchcock in the first program of a proposed new series entitled Suspense. Tonight's forecast program, ladies and gentlemen, represents the ideal form of collaboration. Mr. Alfred Hitchcock, brilliant English director of such outstanding motion pictures as The 39 Steps, Rebecca, and Foreign Correspondent, was eager to create a very special type of radio drama, The Suspense Story. As narrator and star for his production, he thought at once of the distinguished actor with whom he had been associated in countless British film successes, Herbert Marshall. Mr. Marshall suggested that they dramatize a certain favorite story of his. And that story happened to be the very one Mr. Hitchcock had had in mind. Mrs. Bella Clown's classic in Chills, The Lodger. The Lodger is a work of fiction which springs from recorded fact. A story which begins in the year 1888 in London. A London terrorized by the fifth in a succession of recent murders. It was believed that these deeds were the work of one person. A tall, gaunt figure in a black Inverness cape, carrying a small, narrow bag. That meager description, provided by a highly unnerved witness, was the sum total of all that was known of the murderer. It was enough, however, to keep alive and alert the interest of all London, of all those in fine quarters and all those in small, grimy houses, as, for example, Ellen Bunting. Ellen was no different from all the other middle-aged housewives dwelling in the great city's squalid Whitechapel district. She knew all the known facts of the case. As Herbert Marshall will tell you, Ellen knew it was quite proper to refer to this wielder of the knife as the Avenger. Of course, Ellen Bunting was far more concerned with her personal problems than with thoughts of the Avenger. Yet the case of that strange, elusive killer quite often forced all other matters from her mind. There was that mad, meaningless scheme he seemed to follow. All his victims, for example, had been women. All had been young, attractive, and, oddly enough, blonde. But Ellen could no more understand the motive for his brutal slashings than could the police. This night, she and her husband, Robert Bunting, sat before their fireplace reading the newspaper account of the latest murder. The Avenger had struck again. As Ellen expressed it, he might be anybody. He might be the fellow you pass on the street. It's a terrible thought. Yes. If only the police had something to go on. It looks like that Avenger's just too quick for him. Look, it says here that this girl he got last night was like all the others. Hmm. Pretty, blonde, and, uh, let's see, described by her friends as a very light-hearted girl. What a pity. Did you ever stop to think who fits that to a T? In fact, fits all those girls? Why? Why, my own Daisy. Oh, that's a horrible thought. Well, maybe it's a good thing she's with her aunt, then, instead of here. Yeah. London ain't a safe place for any girl right now. Ah, just the same. I can't help thinking how fine it'll be to have her back in. Now, Bunting, you know that Daisy seems just as much my own daughter as she is yours. Yeah. But I'm telling you, there's no sense even thinking about having her back right now. We just can't afford it. Oh, I know that, Ellen. Only, well, well, maybe we could manage it some way. How? Haven't I scrimped myself half crazy trying to keep us going? But you don't care about that, do you? No, your daisy's more important to you than I am. No, 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 Ellen, Ellen, that don't sound like you. Oh, I you, can't but... help if it don't. What are we going to do? Tell me that. We'll get along, dear. Something will turn up. Oh, and... we haven't had a lodger for months. Nobody even comes to look at the room anymore. Yes, but things will work out, Ellen. Oh, they it... ain't never going to work out. Soon we won't even have a roof over our heads and... Oh? Oh, oh I'm sorry, Robbie. I... I didn't mean to take on so. Oh, I know, dear, I know. It's all right. Oh, I, I didn't think it. It's just that I, I've been so worried. Well, don't you go worrying another second, old girl. Why, first thing you know, you won't be pretty anymore. You'll have your face all wrinkled. Now, and you'll... see Now, here, come on, now, let's see a smile. Come on, just have one oh, smile for me. Just alone, one I smile like you used to, eh? Oh, 
And who do you suppose that could be? Of the lake of visitors, I... Bunting. Do you think it could be somebody looking for rooms? Well, it might be. Want me to go to the door? No, I'll go. Oh. You just stay here. Yes, all right. Now, be sure you get a good look at the reason for you. Let them in, dear. Oh, I'm coming. Oh, I do hope it's... <clears throat> Yes, sir. Is it not true that you let lodgings? Yes, sir. Uh, won't you come in, sir? Thank you. Uh, could I, uh, could I take your cape, sir? There's no need. No, I, um, uh, I'm looking for a quiet room. It must be quiet. Oh, we have that, sir. Above all, our, our house is quiet. Uh, your bag, sir, may I take it? No, I'll hold it. Be so good as to show me the room, please. Oh, yes, yes, sir. It's right up these stairs, sir. Uh, this way. Thank you. Uh, you see, sir, uh, there's just my husband and me here, and we're ever so quiet, and, and I'm sure you'll find this room to your liking, sir. Here we are. Now I'll, I'll just light the gas. There. Mm hmm. Very good. It is pleasant, isn't it, sir? And, and there's not many rooms with such pretty pictures. Are there now? We've had them in the family for years, sir, and... Pictures interest me very little. You see, what very impresses me about the room is the very simplicity of it. The, um, the bareness. Uh, yes, sir. It's not at all crowded, is it? It will be quite suitable, Mrs., um... Uh, Bunting. Mrs. Bunting. You see, I do a great deal of studying in my book here. The Holy Bible. Uh, yes, sir. Um, please, sir, uh, let me help with your luggage. No, don't touch it. Oh, but I, I only wish to... Well, you only wish to help, of course. You must forgive me, Mrs. Uh, Bunting. It's just that I... I'm so very weary. Of course, sir. He bringeth them to their desired haven. Beautiful words, Mrs. Bunting. Indeed they are, sir. And now at last I have found my haven of rest. Yes, sir. Then, then you'll be taking the room. Let us see now. Uh, what are you going to charge me? With attendance, mind. I shall be staying in most of the time, and I shall be wanting meals. Oh, we can see to that. Then does um, 30 shillings a week suit you? 30, uh, why, why, yes, sir. Yes, sir, that will be quite all right. Good, and I shall pay you in advance. My name is Sleuth, Mrs. Bunting. Mr. Sleuth. S-L-E-U-T-H. Think of a hound, Mrs. Bunting, and you'll never forget my name. 23, 4, 30, 30 shillings. Thank you, sir. And I think I should enjoy a little... Light supper now, Mrs. Bunting. Bread and butter, perhaps. Could you arrange that? Well, certainly, sir. I I'll do that now. And uh, if you'd be requiring any beer or spirits... Certainly or... not. Oh, sir. What, what did I say? I thought you understood me, Mrs. Bunting, and I had hoped that you and your husband were abstainers. But we are, sir. We don't keep nothing about. I would have had to go out and... Of course, of course. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Bunting. I fear I spoke sharply. I don't wish you to think me rude. After all, you... You've been so kind. Consider it. I hope I know a gentleman when I see one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'll just hurry with your supper. Ellen. Ellen, did he take the room? No, don't bother me now. I have to get him some supper. What do you mean? Uh, come to the kitchen where he won't hear us. He took it, Ellen? Yes, he took the room? Yes. We're all right now. Look. Thirty shillings. No. A week in advance. Oh, it's wonderful. Wonderful. And then, you see what this means? Yes, you can have Daisy now. Yes. Uh, here, Bunting, warm that teapot and put some tea leaves. Right, oh, right. Oh. Yeah, do you know something, old girl? We're not going to worry too much about Daisy being in danger of that Avenger fella. Whatever do you mean, Robbie? Well, she's not a girl who takes a drink, you know. Oh, and what's that to do with it, please? Oh, something I read in the paper while he was upstairs with the gentleman. They just found out that every one of the Avenger's victims had been drinking. They figured he must be some kind of a rabid abstainer. What a peculiar chap. Now hurry, Bunting, please. Yes. Two thoughts, two thoughts only, governed Ellen's mind. The lodger's light supper and her own good fortune at having such a lodger. Mr. Sleuth was an eccentric sort, but then he was such a gentleman, so quiet, so very religiously inclined. She started up a staircase to Mr. Sleuth's room, her husband at her side. Won't do no harm to be safe, though, once Grace is back in London, eh? We'll see she stays closer than the ass, hmm? Well, I'll be downstairs. Hurry up with his supper, old girl. She has cast down many wounded from her. 
Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Come in. And to know the wickedness of folly. Why, Mr. S- yes? What is it? Those pictures. Those pretty girls. You've turned all their faces to the wall. And that maneuver, that strange action, was the beginning of Ellen's concern. Soon there came to her a recollection of the black Inverness cape, the small narrow bag, the urgent matter of alcoholic drink. And these details began to shape themselves into a pattern which grew more disturbing with each passing hour. The day following, the lodger did not leave the upstairs room once, nor did he leave the next day. And the oddness of this took its place in the pattern. Then, too, the approaching arrival of Daisy, her stepdaughter, added to her concern. On the second night, her sleep was restless with vague, horrifying images. And so, when she heard the first stealthy footsteps outside her bedroom, she was instantly awake. Tensely, she followed those steps down the stairs, down the hallway. She heard the front door open and then click shut. Utter stillness fell upon the house. And outside, the streets were so silent she could hear distinctly the clock from a church tower a mile away told the hour. In her troubled frenzy, she pictured a lone figure plodding through the deep fog, moving quietly, stealthily, stalking, searching, finding... Soon after she heard the lodger return, she sought to quiet the horrible dread which had possessed her. She assured herself that Daisy's arrival that day was no cause for alarm. Now she reasoned, how could there be anything really evil about so religious a gentleman as Mr. Sleuth? But for her there was no more sleep, merely a tormented state of half-consciousness, a state which suddenly dropped from her shortly after the daybreak. <laughs> Horrible murder. That was the piercing scream of a newsboy far down the street. The Avenger strikes during night. Ellen Bunting heard the boy cry out the Avenger's latest stroke, made during the night. first glimpse that morning of the grey-faced lodger brought the steepest night's warm terror full to the surface. But on the next instant, she saw the pitiable, helpless weariness in his eyes, and curiously the terror began to pass. She found that she was hoping desperately that her fears were unfounded. Earlier, she had determined to tell Bunting of the awful convictions in her mind. Now, however, she felt she must be certain, certain before she spoke to a soul. She knew there was one thing she must examine. That was the lodger's single piece of luggage. She'd thought of it often. What could it hold? Not much in the way of clothing, surely. It was too small, too too narrow. It was more like a case. A case for a knife. It was along toward noon that Evan found her opportunity to search the lodger's room. Soon after Bunting left to meet Daisy, Mr. Sleuth himself walked from the house... Ellen watched the tall, thin figure in the black Inverness cape disappear down the street, and then she rushed upstairs into the room. Quickly, she moved to the closet. It was no different from what it had always been, utterly empty. She found nothing under the bed. She went then to the chest of drawers against the wall. She opened the top drawer and found inside nothing but a frayed shirt, two handkerchiefs. The next drawer, under clothes, socks. The next empty. There remained then only one possible place for the small, narrow bag, the bottom drawer, and it was locked. Hugging at the drawer, she heard suddenly the opening of the front door downstairs. Panic stricken. She rushed out of the room and down the hall to the head of the stairs. Upstairs, Ellen. Ellen, Daisy's here. Oh, Mother Ellen. It's so good to see you. And well, whatever's the matter? Yes, you've gone quite white. Oh, well, I, I'm all right. I, 
I wasn't expecting you so soon. Oh, you don't know how fine it is to be back, Mother Ellen. Oh, the country's all right in its way, but there's nothing like London now, is there? No, no, there isn't. But as long as that adventure's about, I can see we're going to have to do something about these blonde locks, sailing. Uh, oh, don't worry about that. I'll dye them, maybe. Or, or just pin them under my hat. <laughs> <laughs> Daisy, I, I might as well get you settled. Oh, now, Father, isn't that just like her? <laughs> She's straight to the point. And no point. Well, I'll bet a sixpence you'll have a dust cloth in your hand before you've got your coat <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Bunting, I see my door is open. Oh, we we were just leaving, shall we? Does this mean that all of you have been in my room? Oh, not at all, sir. I... What must I do? Keep it locked? But you see, sir, I was just tidying up a bit, and, and Mr. Bunting, he's brought his daughter up, sir. She she just arrived. This is Daisy, sir. Pleased to meet you, sir. Uh, she, she, she's she been away for quite a long while, you see, Mr. Sleuth, and that, 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 that's why we're a bit excited, you might say. Yes, you must have been surprised when you came in, hearing us laughing and carrying on that way. Yes, yes, I must say I was. However, Miss uh, Daisy, there are all types of joy, are there not? Yes, I'm sure there are. The despicable evil joy of the abandoned and the divine happiness of the blessed. A vast difference, that. You do understand me, don't you? Why, yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Slew. I devoutly hope so, Miss Daisy. Nowadays, there are so very few young women like yourself who do. In fact, I, I all but despaired ever of finding one. If, if you'll excuse us now, sir, we'll, we'll be getting Daisy's things put away. Of course, Mrs. Bunting, and I must be getting to my room. Believe me, Miss Daisy, it's been a revelation to meet you. Oh, thank you, sir. I'm sure we shall have much to discuss. He's a queer one, all right. But such a gentleman, isn't he? At that moment, Ellen had been determined to pour out her terrible knowledge, and then the moment passed by. She told herself that perhaps the past few days had been nothing more than a grim illusion, a tormenting play of imagination. She would wait then until she had attended the coroner's inquest into the last Avenger murder. There, perhaps, she could hear evidence to disprove all her fears, to assure her there was no earthly harm in Daisy being so near the lodger. This was her gravest concern now, for on the next day, Mr. Sleuth made it a point to see the girl more than once, and fearfully, Ellen saw that Daisy welcomed his visits. As Ellen was preparing to step out to the inquest, she heard once more the voices of her stepdaughter and the lodger coming to her through the kitchen door. She hesitated before entering. <laughs> Tense. Strangely apprehensive. I do believe, Mrs. Lewis, I've never known a gentleman with such funny ideas. <laughs> oh, Mother Ellen, you should hear what Mr. Sleuth was just saying. Perhaps, Daisy, you would excuse yourself. And... He thinks people, and especially girls, should spend all their time praying. I sought to explain, Mrs. Bunting, that all women are placed on this earth filled with evil. They therefore must struggle constantly to find the paths of righteousness. Why, Mr. Sleuth? You mean a girl's not to enjoy life at all? Not to have fun? Frivolity, my child, is the devil's breeding ground. And all his implements are there. Temptation, pleasure, wine. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> well, there's nothing I like better than a glass of wine. And I'm not... You drink. She didn't know what she was saying, Mrs. Lee. Just a child. And basically, you'd better go now. But I didn't say nothing wrong. What's the harm in a glass of wine? She lieth in wait as for a prey, and increaseth the transgressors among men. Oh, I don't know what you mean. I never heard such nonsense. You call Holy Scripture nonsense? So what I prayed against is true. You are beyond salvation. That's not so. I'm a good girl, I am, and I won't have you saying that. Daddy, please go into the front room. Quite all right, Mrs. I must be going upstairs anyway. I'm used to being misunderstood, you know. People never realize that my efforts are simply for the greater good of humanity. Of course, sir. And that the power on high will direct my hand toward the expulsion of all evil. Daisy, does he listen to me? Yes. I've got to tell you about... About... About what, Mother Ellen? Nothing. I've got to go out for a while now. I'll be back. <laughs> The moment to reveal the secret horror had come again and passed. 
And in sudden recollection of Mr. Sleuth as he stood in the doorway had overwhelmed her. She must give him this last chance, this last frantic search for this proving evidence, this trip to the inquest. If that chance should fail, then she would tell Bunting or the police. So with the knowledge that Bunting was left in the house to look after Daisy, she boarded the underground train bound for the coroner's court. But as the train pulled away from the station, a new torture came to her, began to mount in her mind. It was the sudden realization that provided Sleuth was the murderer, she was equally responsible for his crimes. She had been giving him protection. Protection, 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 protection. If anything should happen to Daisy, she would be equally guilty. Guilty, 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 guilty. Fully as guilty as the Avenger. Ellen, seated at the rear of the small but crowded inquest room, listened to each of the witnesses as they were called. And from one of them, she found the first hope she had known for many days. This witness lived next to the alley in which the Avenger had committed his crime that night. She had seen him from her window, and the man she described in no way resembled Ellen's lodger. But in another moment, Ellen's hope was swept away. It was pointed out that the fog had been so heavy that night that the witness could not possibly have seen the murderer from her window. She left the stand, replaced by a Mr. Cannot. This elderly gentleman was certain that he had not only seen, but talked with the Avenger. He was in Regent's Park, he testified, only a few moments before... A few moments before the murder, Mr. Coroner, when I saw him, he was quite a tall man, very gaunt-looking, and carrying a handbag. A handbag, you say? Yes, a small, narrow one. Just such a bag, I might add, as might contain a knife. I then heard these words, the tension which had been mounting up within her became almost unbearable. Rigid with horror, she gripped the arms of her chair. She heard the coroner. I shall have to ask for more order in the court. And now, Mr. Cannon, I understand you heard this man speak. Oh, yes. He had a rather high, hesitating voice. An educated man, I would judge, but quite mad. What do you mean by that? Well, as he emerged from the fog, he was talking aloud to himself. Believe me, sir. He was reciting scriptures from the Bible. Scriptures from the Bible. Horrified, Ellen rose from her seat, only half hearing the confusion about her. Are you asking us to believe? I would say, Mr. Cannot, that the man we are looking for would be least of all a religious man. And that's where you're in error, Mr. Coronet. The religious note is the very key to the case. Very interesting. That'll be all, Mr. Cannon. Uh, just a moment, sir. Don't you understand? The man you're after must be a religious maniac. That's the only explanation possible. You will please stand down. The court was dismissing the very truth. Ellen knew that now. She would no longer keep silent. Her hand shot forth and she screamed. I, I want to say... And then Bunting, on the verge of speaking, fainted. And then, when she was revived a few moments later, she said nothing. Her brain was in too great a turmoil, her nerves too shocked. Like one in a dream, she allowed herself to be led from the courtroom. The voices of spectators were only vague sounds to her. I thought she was going to say something. Yes, it was hysteric, say. Yeah, that bit about the knife. Yeah, yeah. The, the knife. knife. The knife. The knife. The knife. As Ellen Bunting proceeded home with the remarks from the spectators remained in her mind, she heard them over and over. We all see she stays closer than the house, eh? No harm in being safe. Direct my hand toward the expulsion of all evil. Expulsion of all evil. What's the harm in a glass of wine? I didn't say nothing wrong. As Ellen neared her neighborhood, her dread increased. With each moving footstep, the grip of terror grew tighter, tighter about her. She moved faster, faster. If only she were in time. She was two streets away from the house. Then one. Then... Then she saw Bunty. 
Sharply, like the thrust of a knife, she realized what this meant. Daisy was left alone with the lodger. Bunting! Bunting! Yes, oh, Bunting, tell me, Bunting. Where's Daisy? Where is she, I say? Where? Why, at home. What? Oh, listen to me. Try to understand. Sleuth is the Avenger. What are you saying? Oh, lodger, he is the Avenger, Bunting. Oh, but there's no time for that. Daisy's in danger. Hurry! Hurry! Yes. Daisy! Daisy! <laughs> You try the sitting room. Daisy! Daisy! Where are you, Daisy? Answer me, Daisy! Oh. By the bedroom. Jeez, she's not here. What about the dining room? Look, she's not there. She's not downstairs. Then there's just his room. Go on. Open the door. Cop, what's the idea here? Have a few more lines to do. As Mr. Marshall, the narrator, you have. Not as Mr. Sleuth, the but lodger. Hitch, you can't stop the play right here. It isn't fair, you know. Why isn't it, Bart? What more is there to say? But Mr. Hitchcock, won't people want to know what Gunting and me found in the room? All right, Ellen. What precisely did you find? Well, uh, nothing, sir. There. You see? Nothing. No lodger, no Bible. And that locked dresser drawer. What about that? We unlocked it, sir. And what was in it? Nothing, sir. You are certain, Mrs. Bunting? Oh, 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 you gave me quite a turn, Mr. Slu... I mean, Mr. Marshall. Uh, yes, sir, I'm sure, sir. There was nothing. Well, begging your pardon, Mr. Hitchcock, but don't you think we'd better just mention about Daisy? I don't know, Bunting. What do you think we ought to say? Oh, just that the reason she wasn't in the house when Ellen and me got there was... Well, she'd gone out for a walk, that's all. Did she enjoy it? Oh, very much, sir. Made it to King's Cross and back in just under an hour, sir. Splendid time, Bunting. Well, there you are, Bart. There's the story. Now, wait a minute, Mr. Hitchcock. You can't do that. That's not the story. Of course it's not. Now, look here, Hitch. Here's the fellow who composed and conducted all our music, Wilbur Hatch. He wants to know about this, too. Everybody does. All right, Bart. What is it they want to know? What became of Mr. Sleuth? Oh, him. Why, he left that afternoon. They never saw him again. And now I think we ought to say something about the Columbia forecast Mr. show Mr. Doctor, will you please... Stop him, Mr. Marshall. Hitch, listen to me. Yes? What is it? They want to know when the Avenger finally was caught. Oh, well, let me ask you something, Bart. Are you acquainted with Loretta Young? Yes, what's that got to do with it? Well, in next week's Columbia preview series, Miss Young will take the starring role in the drama of an American Red Cross nurse. That's good news, isn't it? Oh, that's great. But now listen, Hitch... You've just got to tell that audience exactly when and how Mr. Sleuth was caught. Caught? Why on earth should he be caught? Why? Well, he was the Avenger, wasn't he? Was he? Your guess, gentle listener, is as good as ours. Even Mrs. Bellock Lowndes, who wrote the novel, isn't entirely sure. For his masterful direction, our thanks to Alfred Hitchcock, whose latest pictures are David O. Selznick's Rebecca and Walter Wanger's Foreign Correspondent. For his superb characterization of Mr. Sleuth, our thanks to Herbert Marshall. And our thanks to the outstanding British character actor who tonight portrayed the role of Bunting, Edmund Gwen. If you liked tonight's program and want to hear more in the same highly original Hitchcock vein, radio versions of The Lady Vanishes and The 39 Steps, for example, Write to CBS and tell us so. Your interest will help bring suspense to the air as a weekly feature. <laughs> Forecast next week presents from Hollywood, Loretta Young in Angel, first of a proposed series based on the adventures and the romance of a typical Red Cross nurse. From New York... 
a new sort of comedy show, Ed Gardner as Archie in Duffy's Tavern, with Gertrude Neeson, Colonel Stoopnagel, Larry Adler, and John Kirby's orchestra. Don't miss Forecast at this hour next week. Thomas Friedenzel speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Stories from the world's great literature of pure excitement. A new series frankly dedicated to your horrification and entertainment. Week by week, from the pick of new material, from the pages of best-selling novels, from the theater of Broadway and London, and the sound stages of Hollywood, will parade the most remarkable figures ever known. CBS gives you... Suspense. Tonight's presentation is one of the finest of the contemporary stories of mystery and terror. John Dixon Carr's famous novel, The Burning Court. <laughs> glass of sherry by the fireside of a beautiful suburban home. What could be more comforting? You're an admirable host, Mr. Depart, and it's really a shame our first meeting is under such a cloud. It's also a shame I have so little time to tell you which one of your guests here ah, murdered your uncle last week. <laughs> Now, let's see now. I believe we're all here. Your wife, your friend, Mr. Stevens, Captain Brennan. Yes, and incidentally, yourself. Just who did you say you were? Well, no wonder you've had so much difficulty with the case, Captain. My name is Cross, Gordon Cross, the writer. As a matter of fact, it's because of my just-completed book, Poisoning Throughout the Ages, that I happen to be here now. And Ted Stevens there happens to be a member of the firm which publishes my work. I'd never seen him until tonight, but I've been told what happened. This afternoon, he began reading my manuscript for the first time on the train. The commuter's train, which every afternoon deposits him safely and soundly here in Christmas. I imagine he was halfway home by the time he finished the first chapter. Then he turned a page. Attached to the following leaf was a picture. And looking at it, the young man stiffened suddenly and all but cried out in shock. It was a picture of a young woman, and under it had been printed Famous Poisoner Marie Dobre, 1676. Ted Stevens was looking at a picture of his own wife. <laughs> Imagine, imagine his 25-year-old wife in 17th century costume. The face, the features, even a wistfulness of expression were identical. Even the name, Dobre, was his wife's maiden name. But no, 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 that was ridiculous. This woman in the picture was, well, one of his wife's ancestors. Yes, that was it, that was it. Simply an amazing family resemblance. Marie would be waiting for him at the station and he'd have to tell her about it. He wondered why, however, she'd never told him about... Oh, well, but you don't discuss such an ancestor, do you? Ted Stevens glanced down at the chapter to which the picture had been attached. It was entitled, The Affair of the Non-Dead Woman. Hello, Ted. 
Stevens was almost jolted from his seat. It was Dr. Weldon, professor of English at the college, an old friend of his. Quickly, he thrust the picture beneath the manuscript and moved over. Hi, I didn't see you, Doc. Oh, here, have a, have a seat. Oh, I thought maybe you were giving me the, uh... What, what do they call it? The brush off? Oh, no, I... Uh, say, as a matter of fact, Doc, you're the one man I do want to see. Yeah? Very flattering. Remember those discussions we used to have about murders? <laughs> Better than bridge any time. Well, I got the idea that you'd made sort of a hobby out of the old cases, the historical ones. Well, I've studied quite a number of them, yes. Ever hear of a woman named Marie Dobre? Marie Dobre? Marie Dobre. Oh, yes. Uh, that was her maiden name, of course. One of the finest specialists in arsenic poisoning you could ever hope to find. Oh, we're almost at our station, Ted. Let's get to the door. Yes, a real charmer Marie was. Must have disposed of half a hundred husbands, lovers, suitors, and just plain friends before she was caught. Uh, what happened to her, Doc? She was beheaded and burned. Chris Ben! Oh, absurd, laughable. Ted Stevens kept saying this to himself, and yet what he knew was a foolish dread followed him straight through the small suburban station and clung to him as he reached the street. And there in the roadster was Marie, leaning toward him a little to hold the door open and smiling at him. Oh, Ted, what on earth are you staring at? That street light shining on your hair, I like that. Oh, you're tight. Come on, get in the car. <laughs> Then, like a wisp of smoke, it was gone. The whole ridiculous fear. The delusion. When at home, Marie brought the cocktails into the living room. The logs were burning brightly in the fireplace, throwing a soft, dancing glow upon a room that was darkening with dusk. To you, Marie. And to you, dear. As Stevens placed his glass down, he noticed the manuscript of my book. It was there on the table, right where he placed it when he first came in. Deliberately, he turned from it. And then turned back. The manuscript had been moved. Only an inch or so, but it had been moved. Keeping his back to his wife, he thrummed through that early chapter and discovered, just as he knew he would, that the photograph was gone. For a long moment, he thought of what to do. Then slowly, he turned around. This book by Cross I brought home. Yes? Uh, there was a story of Poisoner in it. Rather funny. Her name happens to be the same as yours. Oh, your maiden name, that is. Oh, that is odd, isn't it? <laughs> Darling, was she a relative of yours? Why, Ted, you're serious. In a way, yes. Oh, I don't mean it's really important. It's just that, well, when you run across a person who's a dead ringer for your own wife and who lived 300 years ago and was a top flight poisoner, well, you like to hear about it, that's all. <laughs> what on earth are you talking about? Darling, be honest with me. Didn't you look at this manuscript when I was out of the room? No. You didn't take out a picture of a poisoner named Marie Debray? I most certainly did not. Oh, Ted, what is this all about? What are you getting at? Oh, just this. Somebody took that picture out of that manuscript since I'd been home. Now, who's that? Well, I'll take a look. Wait, I don't feel like... Why, it's Mark Depard. Mark? Ted, wait a second. Yes? Ted, whatever it is he wants, promise you won't do it. Promise I won't do I it? I mean, promise you won't get yourself involved. Please, Ted. Don't go out tonight. Say, what in the world is... Well, anyway, we can't let him stay out tonight. Mark, how are you? Come on in. Thanks, Ted. Just thinking about giving you a call later. Oh, let me have your hat. Oh, thanks. I, Marie, I, I hope you'll excuse me for popping in like this, but, well, 
I wanted to talk to Ted. It, it's rather important. Well, I don't mind at all. Come on, Mark. We'll step into the library. Oh, you mind, dear? Of course not, Ted. I'll be making the sandwiches for us. Oh, grab that chair in the corner, Mark. Well, let's hear it. What's the trouble? Ted, my Uncle Miles was murdered. Murdered? Oh, the talk hasn't reached you yet. But it's already started. Nothing definite, of course. Just that there was something wrong about Uncle Miles' death. But I don't... Mark, are you sure of this? You know he was murdered? I don't know. Of course I don't. I just don't see how it could be any other way. Uncle Miles, you know, had been sick for quite a while. But last Saturday, he seemed so much better that Miss Corbett, uh, that was his nurse, decided to take the day off. And, oh, well, you know all this. You and Marie were over that afternoon. Anyway, Lucy and I went to the club that night, to that masquerade party, and we left the old boy completely alone. I've cursed myself a thousand times since. But what about your housekeeper, Mrs., uh, what's her name? Henderson. Wasn't she around? Oh, sure. In that little house out in back. We told her to look in now and then, but, well, that wasn't good enough. It was after midnight when Lucy and I got back. Uncle Miles was dying. Ted, it looked exactly like one of his regular attacks. But then later, after he was gone... I happened to glance under the chest of drawers in his room. There was a small silver cup under there, almost drained, and Uncle Miles' cat. The cat was still warm, but quite dead. Oh. I managed to get the cat out of the house and buried without anyone seeing me. Next day, I had the contents of the cup analyzed. It was poison? Yes. Arsenic. Well... What do you want me to do? Help me open the crypt. What? I want to have a private autopsy performed. Help me get Uncle Miles' body out of that vault. Oh, I know it's a tough job. The thing is sealed solid, but we can do it. You mean without the police knowing about it? Without anybody knowing about it. Mrs. Henderson's visiting her sister, and I managed to send Lucy over to the club. You must be crazy. You're playing with dynamite, Mark. This is something you've got to tell the police now. I can't take that chance. But they'll have to know sometime. You're only I've got to know first, I tell you. You don't understand, Ted. There was somebody in Uncle Miles' room that night, handing him something in a silver cup. Mrs. Henderson was on the porch by the window. She saw her. She saw her? Ted. She thinks it was my wife. Oh, Lucy. It doesn't mean anything to Mrs. Henderson yet, because she doesn't suspect anything. But, well, Ted, you've got to see why I've got to be sure, why I've got to know how Uncle Miles died. Because it wasn't Lucy, Ted. I know it wasn't. Of course not, Mark. She had an alibi. Well, she was with you at the club, wasn't she? Yes. Except for half an hour. I see. You'll help me, won't you, Ted? When do we start? As soon as you can make it. Okay. Come on, now. I'll get your hat. You trot on ahead, and I'll come over as soon as I can see Marie. But you're not going to tell her about this. Of course not. I'll think of something. Don't you worry about it. No, that. thanks, Ted. Thanks a lot. Uh, Marie? Come, Tommy. Uh, darling, uh, Mark asked me to, uh... I know, Ted. Here, you better take these sandwiches with you. You'll be hungry. Oh, but you knew I was going out? Yes, I knew. You listened to us? I couldn't help it, Ted. I had an idea what Mark's visit was about. The talk about his uncle's death. There's a lot of gossip about it in the village. That's why I tried to tell you why I didn't want you to get mixed up in it. But it's too late now, isn't it? I mean... You're going, I can tell by the way you look. Ted, wait a second. There's just one thing I want to tell you before you leave. And that is that no matter what happens, no matter what you find or think or believe, I love you. You'll remember that, won't you? I'll remember you said so, Marie. <laughs> By the light of a dim kerosene lantern, Mark and Chet Stevens pounded their way through the thick shelf of rock that covered the Depar's ancestral tomb. Pried open the great slab of stone which lay across the subterranean door, and then at last descended to the dank, ink-black chamber. They found the coffin. They dragged it from its crypt and placed it on the cold stone floor. They unclamped the lid and opened it. Mark! It's empty. That's impossible. It can't be. But it is, Mark. 
You know what this means? That body wasn't in this coffin when it was placed here. I'll swear it was, Ted. From the time that coffin was closed on Uncle Miles, somebody, the undertaker or Lucy or me, somebody was with it until it was buried. And the crypt was sealed right after. Then somebody beat us to it. Somebody's broken in here ahead of us. Broken in? Listen, Ted. Lucy and I have hardly left the house since the funeral. Do you think anybody could break in here? Smash through that stone and cement without our seeing them or without our hearing them? Well, well... What? Well, you might as well come on out then. But who is that? Me, Mr. Depard, up here. My name's Captain Brennan. I'm from the office of the Commissioner of Police. I'd like to talk to you if you don't mind, Mr. Depard. Here, uh, follow my flashlight up. But I don't understand. How did you... How did you know about this? By listening, mainly. Do you mind if we go up to your house, Mr. Depard? Why, no. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, thank you. Oh, Freddy. Uh, look here, Captain, uh, I... Uh, Freddie, this is Mr. Depa, Lieutenant Gray. Glad to know you, Mr. Depa. And Mr. Uh, Ted Stevens, is it? Well, how did you... How did you know my name? Very simple. I got the names of everybody who was here at the Depa the day the old man died. You and your wife were included. Oh, here we are. But I don't... Uh, uh, Captain, who gave you those names? Why, your housekeeper, of course. Mrs. Henderson? You didn't think Mrs. Henderson saw the dead cat, did you, Mr. Depa? But she did. She also saw you bury it. And uh, we've been interested in the case ever since. Well, nice place you have here, Mr. Depard. Now, let's see. According to Mrs. Henderson, your wife was wearing some kind of a masquerade costume that night. What kind of a thing was it? Well, it was... A... Oh, there, you can see it. It was copied from the dress in that old painting over there. Oh, yes. Hmm. Funny, uh, where's the woman's face? It's always been that way, as long as I can remember. Somebody must have thrown acid on it or something. <laughs> Can't blame them much. She was a poisoner. A poisoner? Yes. The story goes that one of my ancestors was responsible for her execution. Marie Dobre, her name was. Oh, yes, I have read about her. Learned all the poison tricks from one of her lovers, a guy by the name of Godin Saint Croix. Godin Saint Oh, yes, Mr. Stevens, we cops read now and then. <laughs> did, did you say... Good as a car? That's French. We call it cross. Ha! Absolutely no limit to a cop's education, is there? <laughs> but to uh, get back to your wife, Mr. Depard, she was dressed like the famous Marie. Now, when Mrs. Henderson looked through that window... Just a minute, Captain. Mrs. Henderson can't prove she saw a thing, and you know it. Now, what do you mean? I mean you haven't any right to insinuate that my wife was in that room. Well, who's insinuating? I, I'm trying to say that Mrs. Henderson... After thinking it over, realized that she was tricked by the costume. The woman she saw in the funny clothes, handing the cup of poison to your uncle, wasn't your wife at all. What? Because your wife is an unusually tall young woman. And the one Mrs. Henderson saw was fully half a head shorter. More on the order, let's say, of uh, Mr. Stevens' wife. My wife? Captain, Why, this is ri absolutely ridiculous. Well, I don't know. It... All right, what's the matter, Mr. Stevens? You're trembling like a leaf. Uh, tell me now, uh, just for fun, where was Mrs. Stevens that night? She was home with me. The whole evening? Certainly. She retired early? Yes, we both did. You, I suppose, were sound asleep by midnight. Yes, I was. Then how do you know where your wife was? Well, I heard Look at Stevens. She had to have a costume that would match Mrs. Day Paz. How did she manage that? Where did she get it? Well, she, she never had one. She never had a dress like that. What about our motive? Why did she poison him? Uh, I don't know. Not for money, suddenly. Then what was it? Hate? Did she hate Miles Depard? Uh, yes, yes, she did. Uh, no. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know, I tell you. Brown. Yes, Freddy. I phoned and got hold of Mrs. Depard and the nurse, all right. That Mrs. Stevens couldn't reach her. Her phone won't answer. Okay, I have her picked up. I'm going home. Stevens, come back here. I'm going to get my wife. Oh, man, stop it, Brown. Cross. Go down, Cross. Cross? Where's my wife? 
What have you done to her? <laughs> you fiend, what have you done to my wife? You are nothing at all, young man. Here, 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 sit down. You're lying. Something's happened to her. The police just phoned. There wasn't an answer. <laughs> Why are you here? Why am I here? Well... <laughs> Because your wife, reading my chapter on the Dubrays, realized I knew more about the family than even she did. Because she found my phone number on the front cover of the manuscript. And because I know an exceptional case when I hear one. Does that answer your question? No, and you know it doesn't. Can't you see I've got to... I've got to know whether... Yeah, I see. Whether your wife is that Marie Dubray, who was burnt... Burnt by order of the High Tribunal for all poison cases. The burning court of France. Witchcraft. Black magic. The world across the threshold. You're quite sure, no doubt, also, that I'm Gaudin Saint Croix, who first wooed her. No, no, my boy. <laughs> no, my real name happens to be, of all things, Tom Simpson. Most unsuitable for a distinguished writing career. And Marie Dobre is no more your wife's real name than mine is Gaudin Cross. What? Your esteemed wife was an adopted child, Mr. Stevens, adopted by people in Canada named Dobray, remote members of the real family of poisoners. I can't believe it. Why? Why didn't she tell me? You, why? Because until I told her half an hour ago, she didn't know it herself. You see, in the course of my research on the family, I found out about it. And in the course of talking with your wife, I found out something else. How for years she was haunted by the fear that she might be a poisoner by inheritance, by blood. And you can see, can't you, why she never talked about it? Her yes. past to you? Yes, yes. And yet, Mr. Stevens, you had all but made her forget that past. You. And that's why she was willing to lie, to steal a picture, do anything, in order to hold you to her. Yes, yes, I, I see that now. You know, young man, I, I rather think she loves you. But as you will see, though, I, she comes only when I call her. Uh, Mrs. Stevens? You mean she's... Yes, Mr. Cross. Marie, it's you. You're all right? Oh, yes, you are both all right now, and nothing can change it ever. Marie, listen. Don't say Marie, dear. Say Maggie. Maggie? Well, oh, that's my name, my real name, Maggie McTavish. And it's a lovely name, dear. The most beautiful, gorgeous... Darling, ever. darling, please, you don't understand. The police, they think you had something to do with Miles' death. They think I did. So, now, Mr. Stevens, before we go back to the Depars, don't you think you'd better tell me everything that's been said and done up to date? Having just saved your wife's soul from the burning court, now I'll rest her body from the electric chair. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Depar, truly excellent sherry. Don't you think so, Miss Corbett? Yes. Yes, it's very nice. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I happen to be here. So let us consider first that supernatural hocus-pocus in the crypt. That body that walked out of the sealed tomb. That body that never was in the tomb. Never was in the tomb? No, Mr. Depar. The murderer knew that very soon Mrs. Henderson's story would bring about an investigation. He had to get rid of the well-known corpus delicti. Yes, but who could have kept the body out of the tomb? Who, Mr. Depar? Why, you, sir. What? 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 <laughs> I, I don't understand. Well, it's very simple. You had the opportunity. I believe you said yourself you were alone with the body before the burial. And you had the strength. I dare say you carried it down to the furnace. Where it's now, probably nothing but ashes. Ridiculous. Why would he spend an hour smashing into a crypt for a body he knew wasn't there? Why, Captain? Hmm. To impress Mr. Stevens, his witness. And also, apparently, you. Oh, that's perfectly fantastic. Fantastic? <laughs> oh, no, Lucy. Just comic. And I suppose, Mr. Cross, that I also put on a woman's masquerade costume, went into my uncle's room and handed him a nice cup of arsenic. No, <laughs> no, no. That had to be done by a woman. Your accomplice, as a matter of fact. Oh, now, come, come, come. You mustn't all look at Mrs. Depar, because Mark Depar's one noble act was his frantic effort to prevent his wife from being charged with the crime. 
a crime which he and nurse Myra Corbett committed. Myra Corbett? Why, you... Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Stevens, this quiet little lady beside me. Why would I do such a thing? Money, Miss Corbett. A cutout of Mark DePaz's inheritance. Payments for services rendered. That's an absolute lie, Croft. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Captain Brennan never bothered to check Miss Corbett's whereabouts on the night of the murder. Why even think of the nurse? She was the custodian of the old man's health. Oh, you're crazy, you're crazy. And yet who but a nurse could so naturally offer the old man a cup? A cup he was sure contained medicine. You're making it up. The whole thing. You're just and who it but Miss Corbett, living right here in this house, would know what kind of masquerade dress she must copy? Would know when Mrs. Henderson would pass the window that night, pass and see her, and accept her, she hoped, for Lucy Depart. No! Oh, that's not true. Oh, yes, Miss Corbett. Yes, Miss Corbett, that dress was the touch that wrecked you. That was your own idea, wasn't it? Not Mark's. You weren't content with a mere murderer's share of the profits. You wanted a wife's share, half of the whole estate. You wanted Lucy Depart convicted and out of the way for good. Mm. Well, I give you a toast, Miss Corbett, with Mr. Depart's excellent sherry, to a particularly ruthless poisoner. And yet, you know, on the whole, I'm rather partial to female poisoners. Why, only tonight I... Mr. Cook, what's the matter, Brennan? This man's dead. Dead? And from cyanide, if I know anything. Cyanide from that glass of sherry. Cyanide that a nurse could get quite easily. That glass was right beside you, Miss Corbett, and nobody else was near it. Too bad he didn't drink it as soon as you hoped. A second ago, we had nobody to use against you. But we have now, Miss Corbett. We have now. And I arrest you for the murder of Gordon Cross. Now close to five months ago that the prominent author was murdered. And tonight, Myra Corbett pays with her life for that crime. The former nurse, at first protesting her innocence... Yes, I'm in here, dear. Oh, oh. I thought you might. Well, what did you cut it off for? Huh? What do you mean? The radio. Oh. Oh, yeah. Well, I thought you wanted to talk. Poor Ted. Don't you think I know you better than that? What was on the radio? Well, there wasn't any... Okay. It was about Myra Corbett. She goes to the chair side. Oh. I didn't think you wanted to be reminded. I don't, really. But making such an effort to hide it only keeps it alive, doesn't it? All right, darling. Know what I came in to ask? If you wanted a cocktail before dinner? The largest one you've got. Fine. I'll get off the ice cube. I know. If I'll fix up the fire. Okay, Maria. A deal. Uh, where are some papers to start it? <laughs> right there by the bookcase. And the name's not Marie. It's Maggie. Because, darling, Marie's dead and gone forever. your hand that touched that glass. I know that now. And I could return the favor. But instead, I shall ask that you dispatch your husband. This one. Like all the others. Now. Just a little bit of poison in the drink, Marie. Any kind of drink. What kind, Ted? Hmm? What kind of a cocktail shall we have? Oh, <laughs> any kind, darling. Any kind at all. You've just heard The Burning Court from John Dixon Carr's famous novel, the first in Columbia's new series of outstanding classics and chills by world-famous authors. Tonight's play, ladies and gentlemen, has one rather special significance we think you'd like to know about. 
As you perhaps have heard, every fine comedian is said to cherish a secret desire to do an abrupt about face. He pines for the part of a blackguard. Well, tonight you witness the fulfillment of one such desire. The role of that literary and quite infamous diehard Gordon Cross was portrayed by none other than Hollywood's expert provoker of laughs, Charlie Ruggles, here in New York for the world premiere of his latest screen success, Friendly Enemies. The role of Marie, well, that was enacted by a young lady who long ago won national acclaim as one of Broadway's most accomplished dramatic actresses, Miss Julie Hayden. Thank you, Charlie Ruggles and Miss Julie Hayden, for your splendid performances. The play tonight, as all plays in this series, was produced and directed by Charles Vander, written by Harold Metford and scored by Bernard Herman. Next week, we bring you an intensely exciting and moving drama, The Life of Nellie James. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense, a new series of programs with one strict purpose in view, your entertainment. Each week at this time, CBS sets aside 30 minutes to excite you, to mystify you, and on occasion to horrify you with a catalog of the world's great thrillers, dramas from the stage and screen, from fiction and radio, dramas that bring you suspense. This second offering of a new series is a unique one. Certainly, it is one of the very few pieces of suspense literature that somehow manages to tickle your funny bone while busily engaged in tingling wet Saturdays. Yes, it's a wet Saturday. Never saw it rain harder. I'm Princey, Frederick Princey, just an ordinary family man. I have a son, a daughter, and a wife. I might be out golfing now if it hadn't been for the rain. I'm Mrs. Princey. I plan to drive over to the nurseries this afternoon for some arbiters. The boarders, you know. But... Oh, the whole lot of them make me sick. Yes, I'm George, son and heir. <laughs> I had a date to go punting. Punting. Couldn't find the blasted punt in this weather, so I'm home too. I I'm Millicent. I was going to play croquet. That's how I happened to have the mallet. Yes, that's the Princey family. We find them at home. Mrs. Princey, Millicent, George sprawled on a couch, Mr. Princey biting on a dry pipe. Their living room is dull and overstuffed. Rain beats at the windows. They are any middle-class family at home on a wet day, except for one small item. As you sit with them in the living room, you can see through the door to the sun porch a pair of men's feet encased in black boots. They look like the feet of a curate. There's a tenseness in the room. The air is charged with excitement, but the feet are very still. Don't keep staring at them. Listen to me, all of you. Don't you see? They hang her. That's what they do. They hang her. Oh, Fred, it's too awful. Awful? Statastrophic? A supposedly sweet, gentle, intelligent girl, respected, loved by the whole village, doing a thing like this? Think of the publicity, the disgrace. You think I'm going to resign from the bench, the vestry, sell out and... Live in some foggy hotel abroad? Oh, no, no. No. No, I kill myself. I will. I will. Don't be a fool. Any more than you have been, the governor being. Be quiet. Wouldn't be so bad if it were you. Everybody in the village knows you're not responsible. George. Yes? Get off that couch. Sit up on your spine. Uh. You might be of a little use here if you could think. Listen, governor, this isn't my funeral. Oh, shut up. As long as I can remember, George, 
You've been a trial and a tribulation to me. Oh, I can't stand it. I can't stand it. You've got to stand it, my dear. And keep that hysterical note out of your voice. You hear? Yes. We are... <clears throat> we are talking about the weather. Now, George. Yeah? George. If he fell down the old well, say, uh, striking his head several times, what about it, eh? I really don't know, Governor. What about it? Don't be an ass. I'm asking you to think. He'd have had to hit the side several times in 30 or 40 feet and, and at all the correct angles. Now, no, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid not. We'll have to go over it all again, Millicent. Oh, no, Father. No, no. I couldn't. I couldn't. Millicent, we must go over it all again. Oh, Fred, you're torturing her. Oh, face facts, Mater. With him lying there, there's no use pretending it's a picnic. <laughs> they might hang you, Millicent. Oh, oh stop that shaking. <gasps> stop it here. You must stop it. You must keep your voice quiet. Listen, we are talking of the weather. Now, we will proceed. I can't. I can't. Not without boots. Oh, should have thought of those boots, Millie. <laughs> I'm not moving them. Oh, sit up, George. Stop shuffling your feet. Now, Millicent, look at me. Answer me truthfully, you hear? Answer me. You were in the croquet court. Yes. Who knew you were in love with this wretched curate? <laughs> Who? The whole village. <laughs> They've been sniggering about it at the pub for three years. <laughs> ah, what a filthy mess. Millicent, we continue. You were on the croquet court. Yes. You were putting the croquet set into its box. Yes. It, it was starting to rain. I was carrying the balls and mallets into the sun porch. The box is there. You heard someone enter the garden gate and come across the yard? Yes. Could you see who it was? No, not at first. I was going into the sun porch. I threw down all the mallets but the red one and turned around. It was with us? Yes. So you called him? Loudly? Did you call him loudly? Could anyone have heard? No, Father, I'm sure not. I didn't really call him. I I just spoke his name. He saw me as I went to the door. He just waved his hand and came over. How can I find out from you whether there was anyone about? Whether he could have been seen? I'm sure not, Father. I'm, I'm quite sure. So, you both went into the sun porch? Yes. It was raining hard then. What did he say? He said, Hello, Millie. And excuse his coming in the back way, but he set out to walk over to Liston. Yes. And he said, Passing the park, he seen the house and suddenly thought of me. And he thought he'd just look in for a moment. He... He had something to tell me. Go on. He said he was so happy. He wanted me to share it. He'd heard from the bishop he was to have a vicarage. And it wasn't only that. It meant he could marry. And then he began to stutter, and get all confused. And of course, I thought he meant me. Don't tell me what you thought. Tell me exactly what he said, nothing else. Well, well... <laughs> oh, stop crying. It's a luxury you can no longer afford. Tell me what happened. He said, no. He said it, it wasn't me. It's Ella Bragdon Davis. And, and he was sorry and, and all that. Then he went to go. And then? I went mad. He turned his back. I had the red mallet of the croquet set in my hand. I forgot to drop it in the box when he came. I... Did you shout or scream? I mean, as you hit him? No. 
out. Sure, I didn't. Then? I threw it down. I came straight in here. I went to look for Mother. No. Oh, poor baby. No. No, I will leave the child alone, Fred. Not such a child, Mater. Hmm, Millie, I had no idea Keep you quiet. had... quiet. I'm thinking. Hmm. You see, George... He probably told people he was going to Liston. Certainly no one knows he came here, for he, he didn't decide until he crossed the park. He might have been attacked in the woods. We must consider every detail. A curate with his head battered in. Don't bother. Don't. A curate, head battered in. Now, who would want to kill with us? Who oh, killed with it? Well, I would with pleasure. How do you do, Mrs. Princey? Captain, Captain, Captain. Oh, sit down, Frey. Mustn't get up for me, Mrs. Princey. You either, Mrs. My word. Just being neighborly on a bad day. I wanted to ask you about those dahlia bulbs, Princey. Took a shortcut on account of the rain and walked right in. Knew you wouldn't mind. Oh, he heard you, Father. <laughs> My dear. We, we, we could all have our little jokes. <laughs> Don't pretend to be shocked. This way, Smollett. This, this, this chair facing the fireplace. Sit down, Mother. Well, oh, just uh, straightening the curtains to the sun porch, dear. It looks so gloomy out there. Might as well shut the rain oh, out. Just talking about a little theoretical cure at killing, Smollett. <laughs> Look, young people these days, night thrillers. Pass on his side. Justifiable pass on his side. Have you heard about Ella Bragdon, Davis? I shall be most properly laughed at. Why? Why should you be laughed at, Smollett? No, oh, and a shot in that direction myself. <laughs> the aunt said yes, too. Haven't you heard? Well, she told most people. Now it'll look as if I got turned down for a white rat in a dog collar. Oh, too bad. No, oh, fortune of war. Yes, fortune of war. Odd how it happens, isn't it? <laughs> Sit down, Smollett. Millicent, console Captain Smollett with your, your best light conversation. You too, Mother. George and I have something to look at outside. Is this rain, you know, but it is bad, very bad. Uh, come, George. Right, old governor. Maybe we'll need raincoats, what? Oh, I don't think so. Uh, just make yourself at home, Smollett. Make yourself at home. A cigarette, Captain Smollett? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, nasty day to be going out. It's something about the old well. Just off the Sunport door, you know. This terrible sodden weather seems to have loosened some of the stones. Oh, too bad. Dash too bad. Spoils the tennis and croquet, I mean, a day like this. Doesn't it, Millie? Doesn't it, Millie? Uh, oh, yes, it does. She was practicing out on the croquet court earlier, but... Uh, oh, do pull your chair nearer the fire, Captain. It was so damp, we thought it would be cozy to light it. Thank you, I'm quite comfortable. I, uh... I hope... You don't feel too bad about Ella, David. Can't always win. Can't say, though, what you women see in these bloodless clerics. Oh, I always thought Mr. Withers was, uh, is a very charming man. Quite agree, but why should anyone want to marry him? You wouldn't want to marry him, would you, Millie? Not now. That is, I... Are you... Oh. Oh, no, of course not. Smollett. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, Princey. Good Lord, man, you... You come in on a fellow suddenly. <laughs> Guess I did. <laughs> oh, don't mind this old double barrel shotgun. Been working on it. Smollett, may I have your attention for a minute? There's something on the sun porch I'd like to show you. Why, yes. Yes, of course. Smollett, George and I went out to see if we could shoot some rats which have been driven out of the old well by the high water. Afraid they might get into the house. Now, you must listen to me very carefully. Very carefully, or you will be shot by accident. Princey, what's got into you? You heard me ask as you came in, who would kill with us? You also heard Millicent make a comment, an unguarded comment. Well, what of it? Very little. Unless you were to hear that Withers had met a violent end this very afternoon. And that, my dear Smollett, is what you are going to hear. What? Withers? Yes. 
Who killed him? Millicent. Good Lord. Yes, it's a mess. And of course, you would have remembered and guessed. Maybe, yes. Yes, I... Yes, I, I suppose I should. Therefore, you constitute a problem. Why did she kill him? Oh, it's one of those disgusting things. Pitiable, too. She deluded herself that he was in love with her. Good heavens, Millie. Oh, yes, of course, I... I see. He had told her about the David girl. I understand. Now, I have no wish, as you will comprehend, that she should be proved either a lunatic or a murderess. I could hardly go on living here after that. I suppose not. On the other hand, you know about it. Yes, I see that makes me a problem. <laughs> You're wondering if I could keep my mouth shut. If I promise... I am wondering if I could believe you. But if I promise... If things went smoothly, yes. But not if there was any sort of suspicion, any questioning. You would be afraid of being an accessory. Why, I don't know. I do. What are we going to do? I, I can't see anything else, you... You'd never be fool enough to do me in. You, you can't get rid of two corpses. Oh, I regard it as a better risk than the other. It could be an accident. Or you and Wither could both disappear. There are possibilities in that. Listen, you, you can't. I can, but there may be a way out. There is. Smollett, you gave it to me yourself. I, I did what? You said you would kill with us. You have a motive. Oh, look here, I, I was joking. Of course you saw that. You are always joking. Listen, Smollett, I can't trust you. You must trust me. Else I will kill you now in the next minute. I mean that. You can choose between dying and living. Go on. Now there's the old well just outside the sun porch door. That's where I'm going to put with us. No one outside knows he has come up here this afternoon. No one will ever look there for him unless you tell them. You must give me evidence that you have murdered Withers. I murdered him? Why do you want that? So that I shall be dead sure that you will never open your lips on the subject. I see. What evidence? George, hit him in the face. Sure. George, stop! Keep out of this. Oh, Captain, you should be more careful. Look what your teeth did to my knuckles. Again, George. Okay. Oh, I can't stand it. Oh, keep quiet. You women, keep out of this. I'm sorry, Smollett, but there must be traces of a struggle between you and Withers. Then it will not be altogether safe for you to go to the police. <laughs> can't you take my word, man? I will when we are finished. George, yes? get the coke, Mary. Right, Governor. Take your handkerchief to it. In there, on the sun porch floor. Yeah. Yes, I got it, Governor. There, Captain. There's the weapon. As I told you, Smollett. Now, you'll just grasp the end that mashed Wither's head. I shall shoot you if you don't. But good Lord, you can't. All right. There. That's it. Now deposit it out by the side of the house. Out of the rain, of course. No. Wait, George. Eh? Yeah? First, you'd better pull a few hairs out of his head and put them under the nails of Wither's right hand. Uh -huh. Prince, have you gone mad? Do you know what you're doing? With this gun, yes. Go ahead, George. <laughs> Sorry to mush your hair up, Captain. Uh -oh. Oh, shut up, Smollett. There. That's all we need. Now, for Wither's, we'll fix it right up. Be right with you, Governor. Smollett. You may turn around. Withers is just there in the sun porch. Draw back the curtain. Good Lord, Prince. Yes, messy. But we'll get him fixed up. Now you, Smollett, you've just got to drag him through the door and dump him in the old well. <laughs> just beyond the door, Captain. I, I won't touch him. I won't try. All right. Stand aside. Out of range, George. Right. Only one place I want this bullet to go. Father. Oh, Father. Keep quiet. My aim's not too good. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I... That's I... better, Smollett. Much better. Go on now. In here. You have to take him outside. By the shoulders ought to do it, Captain. Keep quiet, George. Go on, Smollett. 
Go on. You've seen dead men before. Crack him. Crack him. I'll just hold the gun here to make sure that everything goes on. Come away from the dim window, dear. Don't look. But Captain Smollett, your father is a very resourceful man, Millicent. I'm sure what he's doing is right. But the Captain, I can't. I can't stand it. You mustn't question your dear father. I say, are you two still at it? There's enough trouble around here without blubbering. I'm not blubbering, George Pinsley. So you see, Smollett, everything is perfect. They're never looking our way. You see how safe it is? I it is. Oh, good heavens, man. You're, you're dripping wet. Why, why, why didn't you slip your raincoat on? <laughs> Tea ready, my dear? In just a minute, dear. I'll ring for Bridget. Ah, exactly what you need, Smollett. Cup of tea. Best thing in the world to ward off a cold. Sit down, won't you? Oh, don't mind getting the chair wet. Cigarette? Help yourself. I stick to my pipe, you know. Funny Please, how... Princess, everything's hot, ma'am. Oh, Bridget, yes. Put the tray in front of me here, on the table. Yes, ma'am. That's it. I say, Captain, you've gone and cut your lip. I, I just knocked it. Oh, how dreadful. Here, Bridget, yes, give ma'am. the Captain this cup. Oh, no, thank you. I, I, I rather think I've been running along now, if you don't mind. Oh, my Captain Smollett, without any tea. If you don't mind, Mrs. Princey, if... If I could just have my raincoat. Oh, I'll get it for you, Captain. Oh, this is very distressing, Smollett. Very. Oh, I, I'll be all right presently, I'm sure. Here we are. Now, let me help you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, young man. There. I'd better go out the front way, Smollett. The walk is dry. Oh, let me hold the door for you, Captain. <laughs> Don't worry, old fellow. Don't worry at all. No, no. I... I... Nothing serious, I imagine. It'll rest and he'll be as right as rain. By the way, Millicent, you're not looking any too well. No, not well at all. I'm sure it was that croak he caught. Being outdoors in weather like this is simply foolhardy. The maid is right, Millie. You saw what happened to Captain Smollett. Oh, come along, dear. I shall give you a hot foot bath and put you to bed. And a couple of days in bed and you'll be fine again. Get plenty of rest, Millicent, and don't worry about a thing. That's the best cure. <sighs> well, I guess I'll have a little rest too, Governor. It's a fine afternoon for a nap. Indeed it is, son. Well, enjoy yourself. I'll see you later. I'll see you all later. Do get me the police station, please. Police station? Right away, sir. Police headquarters, Sergeant Yancey speaking. Oh, hello, Sergeant. This is Prince here of Abbott's Road. I, I believe you know me. Oh, indeed I do, Mr. Prince. Sergeant, a horrible thing has just happened. Quite extraordinary. Murder, in fact. Murder? I'm afraid it looks rather bad for... Well, for, for a close friend of ours, unfortunately. We saw him do it. I, I think you'd better send someone over right away. Our oh, man should be there right about now, Mr. Princey. I... I beg your pardon? I say, our man should be there now. Constable Martin has his post right below the house there. Just rang in. Seems Captain Smollett was with him. <laughs> Captain Smollett? He reported some rather queer going down at your place. But I certainly didn't understand it was murder. So just don't touch anything, Mr. Princey. And don't worry. Don't worry at all. No. No, no, no. I, I won't, Sergeant. Thank you. Governor! Governor, where are you? I'm, uh, there's a man I'm right here. Uh, Stop shouting! Uh, we... We have some visitors, Governor. Oh, yes. Yes, yes, I, I, I can see that. Well, Constable, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Prince. And Smollett, I, I say what a, what a remarkable fellow you are, coming back like this, here to reenact the crime. Only the one against me, Prince. The one against the curate. I'll leave to you people. <laughs> 
extraordinary sense of humor. Mr. Prince, I just had a look at what's in your well. Not a pretty sight, that. Not pretty at all. Yes, Captain Smollett was thorough, if nothing else. You saw him when he did it, sir, out in the back? No, quite. We were just returning from a walk. Smollett evidently had been laying for the curate, hiding out in those bushes by the road, I imagine. He was never inside this house. Never. And uh, you say, Captain... I say that while I was inside this house, a guest of the family, I was coerced into dragging the curate's body outside and dumping it in the well. Well, there we are. Uh, not entirely, Constable. Uh, I'll just remove my raincoat. There. And demonstrate how damp I got my clothes when I went outside without it. No. That's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> Quite. <laughs> He undoubtedly removed his coat at some point between here and your post. I might as well tell you that his weapon, a red crooky mallet, is out by the side of the house. I shouldn't be at all surprised, but that you'd find his fingerprints all over it. All over the end of the mallet, Constable. The end that mashed withers his head. And not the end I'd have had to grasp in order to do the mashing. Governor, <laughs> that's a decent try, Smollett. <laughs> but it won't work. There must be other evidences, Constable. You'll undoubtedly find them when you examine the body. Oh, he means my hair under Withers' nails. Well, sir, if you look carefully, I believe you'll find a few of my precious hairs under his son's nails, too. Here, what are you trying to... Constable, this is an utter waste of time. So far as the violent struggle between Smollett and Withers is concerned, Smollett's face speaks for itself. Quite eloquently, I believe. Oh, but no more eloquently than your son's knuckles. As you see, Constable, a fresh abrasion. He did that on my teeth. Or did he? What? I say, or did he? He might have done that on Withers' teeth. <laughs> oh, I see. I see what you mean, but... But, but I didn't. G Governor, he said I... Oh, keep still, you nitwit. Let me think. Let me think. As a matter of fact, George, the more I think of it, the more I'm convinced it was your voice I heard. Quite a vigorous quarrel. Something about the curate duting your sister. Oh, don't be ridiculous, Smollett. Very well, Princey. If your son didn't do it, who did? That's what I'd like to know. How about it, Mr. Princey? Well, that... That is a sticker, all right. <laughs> George, my boy, it looks like you're elected. Elected? What do you mean? I didn't do it. Why, I don't... Keep nothing to your do. mouth shut, will you? I won't. I'm not going to take the blame for her. Millie did it. She did it with that mallet, I saw. You could prove that? Prove it? I... I... Yes, her, her fingerprints on the mallet, the handle. Why, George, don't you remember when you made me touch the mallet? Huh? When you picked it up with your handkerchief? No, I... George, I'm sure you wiped that handle clean. Oh, well, I could hardly expect you to remember that if you, if you can't even remember killing the curate. Governor, I... I told you to keep still. Oh, Governor, you, you're not going to turn me over. You, as you're... long as I can remember, George, you've been a trial and a tribulation to me. Governor, I... You shouldn't have done it, son. You really shouldn't. No, George, that was definitely wrong. <laughs> I say, Princey, I think I'll have that cup of tea after all. Nothing like it in weather like this. Wet Saturday, from the short story by John Collier. You have just heard the second in Columbia's new series, a series designed to bring you the best in thrill entertainment. Outstanding dramas from the field of fiction and radio, stage and screen. Dramas of pure suspense. This Columbia feature is produced and directed by Charles Vanda, with scripts by Harold Bedford and score by Bernard Herman. Be with us again next week at the same time when we present Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. If you have just a few seconds, I'd like to say something before Columbia goes on with its programs. My name is Mary Ann Spitz, and I'm 14 years old. My mother has a defense job, so I do the marketing for our family. Every morning, Mother says to me, Mary Ann, be sure you buy the most for the least money. So lately, I've been buying all the Victory Food Specials. These are marked with a red, white, and blue basket sign with a big red V. The reason I always look for this sign is 
Well, you've heard the old saying, an army travels on its stomach. I know Uncle Sam needs lots of food to feed our fighting men. An army that, that's going places has to have good things to eat. Now, steak fried rare with French, with French fried potatoes is my favorite meal. But I'd rather have a soldier eat this dinner than eat it myself, if it will get this war over sooner. So, if you have friends or relatives in the armed forces, think twice before you buy the food they need. Look for the victory specials and help win the war faster. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Columbia's play theater of outstanding thrillers, produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from fiction and stage and screen, from the world's great literature of entertaining excitement, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Tonight's adventure in suspense is from the pen of Dorothy Sayers. She called it the Cave of Alibaba. Like the tale told by Scheherazade, a distinguished ancestress in the storytelling art, Miss Sayers' thriller deals with 40 thieves and with two magic words. For your uneasy listening, then, suspense presents The Cave of Alibaba. On a Saturday afternoon in January, in the grim and narrow house in Lambeth, a man sat eating kippers and reading the daily paper. He was smallish and spare, with brown hair rather too regularly waved and a strong, brown, pointed beard. His double-breasted navy blue suit, his socks, tie, and handkerchief were all scrupulously matched, and his brown boots just a trifle too highly polished. He did not look a gentleman, not even a gentleman's gentleman. Yet there was something about his appearance which suggested that he was accustomed to the manner of life in good families. A uh, superior butler, perhaps. Yet not old enough to be retired. A footman who had come into a legacy, yes. He had just finished eating, and he was sipping his coffee, when a slight noise at the front door caught his ear. Swiftly. Too swiftly for a quiet little man sitting, eating kippers and reading his paper on a Saturday afternoon, he sprang up, he dashed through the small hallway, and he flung the door open. Of course, no one in sight. The society is at least dramatic in its delivery of its correspondence. And as if he knew what he would find, he shut the door and turned to the hat stand in the hall. An envelope had been placed there. It was addressed to Joseph Rogers. So Mr. Rogers opened the note. Number 21. An extraordinary general meeting will be held tonight at the house of number one at 11.30. You will be absent at your peril. The word is finality. Hmm. Finality. Yes, I think so. The man called Joseph Rogers stood for a moment, studying the note. Then he strode to the rear of the house to a tall safe built in the wall. Carefully, he manipulated a dial. He swung the safe door open. He stepped inside into a small strong room. He opened a drawer marked correspondence, placed the note inside, and then came out again. A moment to reset the lock for a new combination, and then he went back into the living room. He reached for the telephone. He lifted it from the cradle and then reconsidered. Too dangerous. He hurried upstairs and clambered into an attic. In the furthest corner, he searched for and found a knothole in the woodwork. He pressed it. 
A concealed trap door swung open, and he was in the loft of the adjoining house. He paused before three cages, in each of them a carrier pigeon. Carefully, he wrote a note, slipped it under a pigeon's wing. There you are, my pretty. There, take it easy now. There you go. Fly straight. 4.30. I'll send another pigeon at 5 and the third at 6. I should have my answer by 9.30 at the least. Oh, I forgot one thing most important. Mr. Rogers moved through the trap door, back into the attic of his own house, and once again he stood before the tall safe built in the wall. He opened the door, stepped into the strong room, moved for a moment quietly in the dark, and then spoke gently. Now, be good, my sweetheart. I'm depending on you. Open Sesame. Come on now, old thing. Open Sesame. Open Sesame. Ah, that's better. That's very much better. By 9.30, his answer was back. All the little piece of paper said was a hasty okay. At a quarter before 11, he took his revolver from a locked drawer, inspected it carefully. Yes, loaded it with cartridges from an unbroken packet and left the house. He walked quickly, keeping well away from the wall. And when he climbed on a bus, he sat next to the conductor, where he could watch all who got on and off. By 25 minutes after 11, he was out on lonely Hampstead Heath, pausing in the shadow of a large tree to adjust a black velvet mask on which, in white thread, was stitched the number 21. Then he stepped briskly to the door of the villa that lay before him and... What is it? Finality. Come in. Go right on through. Number one will check you in. Right. Twenty-one, sir. Lift your mask. Very well, twenty-one. You may go on to the meeting room. Thank you, sir. of the villa in which Mr. Rogers now stood was a large one, a brilliantly lighted room. There was a gramophone in one corner blaring out a jazz tune. To its rhythm, couples, masked men and women, were dancing. Some were in evening dress, some in tweeds and jumpers. In another corner of the room was the bar. Mr. Rogers went up to it and asked the masked man in charge for a double whiskey. He consumed it slowly, leaning on the bar. The room filled. Presently, someone moved across to the gramophone and stopped it. Mr. Rogers looked around. Number one, the massive gentleman in evening dress who had checked him in appeared on the threshold. A tall woman in black stood beside him. Her mask, embroidered with a white number two, covered her hair and her face completely. Only her, her fine bearing, her white arms, and her dark eyes shining through the eye slits, proclaimed her as a woman of power, of physical attraction. The masked dancers were silent now as number one spoke. Ladies and gentlemen, we are short two members tonight. I need not inform you of the disastrous failure of our plan for obtaining the plans of the court Wendelsham Heliscoper. Our courageous and devoted friends, number 15 and number 38, we are betrayed and taken by the police. Some of you might fear that under examination these two would break down and give away our society. There is no need for such a fear. I gave the usual orders, and their tongues have been silenced. Their defendants will be discreetly compensated in the usual manner. I call upon number 12 and 34 to undertake this agreeable task. They will attend me at my office for their instructions after the meeting. Will the numbers I have named kindly signify by raising their hands 
that are able and willing to perform this duty? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your partners for the next dance. The gramophone struck up again. Mr. Rogers turned to a girl near him in a red dress. She nodded, and they slipped into the movement of a foxtrot. The couples gyrated solemnly and in silence. Their shadows were flung against the blinds as they turned and stepped to and fro. The girl in red spoke to Mr. Rogers. What's happened? I'm frightened, aren't you? It seems as if something awful was about to happen. It does take one a bit short. Number one's way of doing things. But it's safer like that. Oh, there's four men. Don't uh, talk in praise. You know the rules. Sorry. In silence, the dance continued. And then it came to an end. And then when it had finished, the dancers came again to where number one sat and waited with tense eagerness for him to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, you may wonder why this extraordinary meeting has been called. The reason is a serious one. The failure of our recent attempt was no accident. The police were not on the premises last night by accident. We have a traitor amongst us. This last failure was not the first. You'll remember the unfortunate way in which the affair of the Dinglewood first turned out. And there were others. However, I am happy to say that our minds can now be easy. All these troubles have been traced to their origin. The offender has been discovered and will be removed. The misguided member who introduced the traitor to our ranks will be placed in a position where his lack of caution will have no further ill effects. There's no cause for alarm. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, please take your partners for the next dance. Again, the gramophone took up its bizarre monotony, and the masked dancers glided and turned, and their movements were sharper, more staccato. The girl in red was claimed by a tall mask in evening dress. A hand laid on Mr. Rogers' arm made him start. A small, plump woman in a green jumper slipped a cold hand into his. The dance went on. When it stopped, everyone stood detached, stiffened in expectation. The endless interval was over. Number one raised his voice. Ladies and gentlemen, you will no doubt wish to be relieved of the questions on your mind. I will name the persons involved. Number 37. No, no. I don't I swear on it. I You have failed in discretion. You will be dealt with. If you have anything to say in defense of your folly, I'll hear it later. Sit down. Number 37 sank down upon a chair. He pushed his handkerchief under the mask to wipe his face. Two tall men closed in upon him. The rest fell back. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now name the traitor. Stand forward. Number 21. Take off your mask. Number 37. This man was introduced to our society by you under the name of Joseph Rogers, formerly second footman in the service of the Duke of Denver, dismissed for petty thievery. Did you take steps to verify the statement? I did. I did as God's my witness. It was all straight. I had him identified by two of the servants. I asked all over about him. The story was so I swear it was. Number 21. Your name has been given as Joseph Rogers. Is that your real name? Ask me. Is that your real name? No. What is your name? Peter Death Breden Whimsy. Silence! My compliments, your lordship. We thought Lord Whimsy was dead. He was killed, so the people said two winters ago while shooting big game in Africa. He even left a will, proved at 500,000 pounds. To his mother, I believe, the Dowager Duchess of Denver. Lord Peter Whimsy, indeed. Well known book collector, man about town, distinguished criminologist. Took an active part in the solution of several famous mysteries. Taking an active part, if you don't mind. So you deliberately led us to think you were dead and became Joseph Rogers to gain entrance to our society. What has become of the real Joseph Rogers? He died abroad. I I took his place. And the end of your impersonation to uncover our society. Precisely. I see. 
The robbery of your own set, upon which we congratulated ourselves, and which you helped to execute, was arranged. Obviously. The robbery of the Duchess, your mother, was arranged by you. It was. It was a very ugly tiara, no real loss to anybody with decent taste. The burglary of the Winthrop Mansion, the theft of the necklace at Covent Garden, the others as well. You arranged them all. All. Uh, may I smoke, by the way? You may not. Numbers 15, 22, 39. You have watched the prisoner. Has he made any attempt to communicate with anybody? Uh, none. His letters and parcels have been opened. His telephone chats and his movements followed. Even the water pipes in his house have been under observation for Morse code signals. You're certain? Absolutely. Then we may be sure that he has been alone in this adventure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please take oh, your... Oh, Very well. Take the prisoner away. And be sure you explain carefully to him first the manner of his death. I am sure he'll enjoy it. Wait, wait, at least you can let me die decently. Take him away. Stop, I have something to say, something to sell. We make no bargains with traitors. No, but listen. Do you think I haven't thought of this? I'm not a fool. I've left a letter. To whom? To the police. If I don't return tomorrow, it'll be opened. Mr. Buff, the prisoner sent no letter. He's been strictly watched for months. I left the letter before I came to Lambeth. Then it can't contain no information of any better. Oh, but it does. The combination of my safe. Indeed? Has this man's safe been searched? Yes. What did it contain? No information of importance, sir. An outline of our organization, the name of the house, nothing that can't be altered and covered before morning. And did you investigate the inner compartment of the safe? You hear what he says, did you? He's trying to bluff. There is no inner compartment. I hate to contradict you, but I'm really afraid you must have overlooked it. And what did you say was in the compartment, if it does exist? The names of every member of this society with their addresses, photographs, and fingerprints. Oh, no, 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 True, the fingerprints of my watch has adorned the first page of the collection. That statement can be proved? Certainly. The name of number 40, for example, is... <laughs> if you mention names here, you will certainly have no hope of mercy. Bring the prisoner to my office. Ladies and gentlemen, take your partners for the next dance. Yes. Prove that I know your gang from number one through number twenty-five. Do you want me to prove that I know the others as well? My lord, your story fills me with regret that you are not, in fact, a member of our society. Which courage and industry are valuable in an association like ours? I fear I cannot persuade you. No, I suppose not. Yes? Ask the members kindly to proceed to the supper room. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not conceal from you the seriousness of the situation. The prisoner has recited to me 25 names and addresses which were thought to be unknown except to their owners and to me. There has been great carelessness. Fingerprints have been obtained. He showed me some photographs of them. He tells me that the book of names and addresses is to be found in the inner compartment of his safe together with certain letters and papers stolen from the houses of members and several objects with fingerprints. I believe he tells the truth. He offers the combination of the safe in exchange for a quick death. I think his offer should be accepted. What is your opinion, ladies and gentlemen? The combination is known already. Fool! This man is Lord Peter Wimsey, a scientist of crime. Do you think he will have forgotten to change the combination? Oh, I say give him the promise. I'm getting short. Yes, 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 yes. You are agreed? Yes, 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 yes. It's a bargain, Wendy. What is the combination? The word of the combination is unreliability. And the inner door, the inner compartment. In anticipation of the visit of the police, the inner door is open. Good. Number 12 and 36. You will go to the prisoner's house and... Why is it any more? That's right. Uh, I agree. Nobody ought to be trusted. Then what, ladies and gentlemen, do you address? You go yourself. You're the only one that knows all the names. You go yourself. I second that motion. Is the wish of the meeting then that I should go? No. I say no. So don't go. Number one is our president, the head and soul of our society. If anything should happen to him, where should we be? You've all blundered. We have your carelessness to thank for all this. Do you think we should be safe for five minutes if he were not here to repair your folly? Well, there's something in that. 
If you will pardon my suggesting it, the lady appears to be in a position peculiarly favorable for the reception of the president's confidences. The contents of my modest volume will be no news to her. Why should she not go herself? Because I say she must not. If it is the will of the meeting, I'll go. Give me the key of the house. Here. Is your house watched? No. If I have not returned in two hours, act for the best to save yourself. And do what you like with the prisoner. The president has been gone two hours. Traitor! What's happened to him? How should I know? Perhaps he's uh, looked after himself and gone while the going was good. Liar! Oh. He'd never do that. What have you done with him? Speak! Or I'll make you speak. Well, I can I can only form a guess, madam. I'm afraid that your president may quite inadvertently have left the door of the inner compartment closed behind him, in which case... Yes. Well, let me explain the mechanism of my safe. Hmm? The inner compartment has two doors. The outermost most opens outward with an ordinary key. Oh, do you think that the president is so stupid as to be caught in an obvious trap? Undoubtedly, he will have wedged open that inner door. Undoubtedly, madam. But the sole purpose of that inner door is to appear to be the only one. Hidden behind the hinge of that door is another, a sliding panel, also left open. Inside the compartment is the big, heavy ledger containing all the information about this society. This ledger lies on a steel shelf. Uh, do I make myself clear? Oh, yes, 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 go on. The steel shelf is balanced on a concealed spring. When the weight of the book, the ledger, is lifted, the shelf rises almost imperceptibly, and in rising it makes an electrical contact. Now, let me draw a picture. Your president steps into the inner compartment, sees the book, takes it up, Anxiously to examine to see if it's the right one. The shelf rises, the electrical contact is made, and the steel panel behind him slides into place. He's trapped. You devil! What is the word that opens the inner door? Quick, the word! Do you remember the story of Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves? Uh-huh. Well, when, when I had this safe constructed, my mind went back, well, call me sentimental if you will, to my childhood. The words that open the door are open sesame. Oh. How long can a man live in this devil's trap of yours? Oh, I should think he might hold out for a few hours if he didn't use up all the oxygen by hammering and yelling. I imagine if we go there at once, we'll be able to get him out all right. I'll go myself. I think you'd better take me with you. Why? Well, I'm the only person who can open the door. But you've given me the word. Yes, you have the word. This door of mine, (laughs) I'm rather proud of it. You know, it's my own invention. It's the latest thing. It will open to the word open sesame all right. But to my voice only. Your voice. I'll chop your voice in my hands. Don't, don't, what do you mean, your voice only? Don't touch my throat like that. You'll wreck my voice and then the door might not recognize it. Ah. There, that's better. The door got stuck for a week once and when I had a cold. Is what he says true? Is it possible? Perfectly possible, madam. It will have a microphone arrangement. It could be done also with light vibrations. Oh, we must let him go. Take the ropes off him. Let him go. Nothing. He doesn't go to blab to the police. The president's done in, that's all. And we'd all better make traps while we can. It's all up, boys. Right. Chuck his fellow down the cellar and burst him in. I'll go and destroy the ledgers. 32, you know where the switch is. Give us a quarter of an hour to clear, then you can blow the place to glory. No. No, you can't leave one to die. He's your president, your leader. I won't let it happen. I won't. I'll free this man myself. Here, yeah, none of that. Let me go. Let go of me. Think, Let me go. think. It'll be light in an hour or two. The police may be here at any moment. Police. Oh, yes. Yes, you're right. No, we mustn't imperil the safety of all for just one man. He himself would not wish it. Throw this man in the cellar and let's get out of here while I sign. <laughs> Here. Uh, this is good enough. Leave him here. Right. Uh, now, now, let's go. Hey, you chaps. Yeah, I should have gagged him. I say, it's lonesome down here in this cellar. You might at least leave the light on. Don't worry about the dark. They're taking you here as a time to for the bomb that's going to blow out this place. It's all set. You won't have long to wait. Uh, not <laughs> long. <laughs> Who is it? Who's there? Shh. Hold still. So I can cut the ropes. 
Well, if it isn't two. My compliments, madam, on your loyalty to your present. Quick, quick. They've set the time fuse. The house is mine. Follow me as fast as you can. Number one must be saved. And only you can do it. Well, how did you manage to? Oh, there, there's no time for questions. Get up and follow me. You will release him. You promise. I promise. But I warn you, madam, that this house is surrounded. When my safe uh, door closed, it gave a signal yes. to Scotland Yard. All the members of the society have taken. Oh, never mind them. Here. Is that you, Inspector? Get yourself out of the way, quick. The house is going up in a minute. Quincy! Oh, Quincy! It's Inspector Parker, old man. Are you all right? Yeah, I'm a bit winded. What happened, Inspector? Oh, about half a dozen of them got blown up. The rest we bagged. Uh, hurry, will you hurry? Who's this? Oh, one of the gang. She's called number two. We're the safe. We must. Golly, I clean forgot the gentleman in the safe. Uh, Parker, where's your car? Down the lane. Send one of your men down to get it. Right. Uh, Johnson, bring that car here. Yes, sir. I got the, the number one of the whole company. Quietly asphyxiating at home. I promised we'd get back and save him. He's the bloke that we've been wanting. The man at the back of the Morrison case and the Hope Wilmington case and hundreds of others. Is this it? Hmm. Quite a contraption. Yes, I only hope he hasn't upset the adjustment by something like oh, Oh, please, Ollie. I hope you haven't heard my voice. Oh, you sound uh, all right. I can only be conversational. Come on, old thing. Show us your paces. Open sesame. Open sesame, confound you. Open sesame. Open sesame. He did. Let me see. No, he's not. He lived to stand his trial. right with the world, as it always is when Lord Peter Whimsey is involved. The Cave of Alibaba by Dorothy Sayers is the story which gave us tonight's suspense. Suspense is produced by William Spear. Our guest director for this evening was Robert Louis Sheehan. Tonight's radio drama was written by Peter Lyon and scored by Bernard Herman. Romney Brent was Peter Whimsey, William Moulton played number one, and Ira Gerald, the lady in the case. Others on the cast were Kathleen Cordell, Victor Beecroft, Roland Bottomley, J.W. Austin, William Podmore, Ian Martin, and William Walton. Next Wednesday, suspense will not be heard because of a special all-star Hollywood broadcast which Paramount Pictures will present. Two weeks from tonight, at this time, Columbia will bring you another selected story from the world's great literature of thrills. Another study in... Suspense. Columbia Broadcasting System. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense.
produced and directed by William Spear, and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented each week to bring you to the edge of your chair, to keep you in suspense. Good evening. This is Orson Welles. And very happy I am to be back in the United States and back on the Columbia Network, even for so short a visit as this one. Back with old friends like Johnny Dietz, who's tonight's director, and Bernard Herman. The Mercury Theater presented tonight's radio play for the first time last year. They came right out then and hailed it as a classic of the medium. Nobody argued the point. A lot of people asked us to do it again, so it's gratifying to get the chance now and to find a favorite of ours in this distinguished anthology of spook shows. Personally, I've never met anybody who didn't like a good ghost story. But I know a lot of people who think there are a lot of people who don't like a good ghost story. For the benefit of these, at least, I go on record at the outset of this evening's entertainment with a sober assurance that although blood may be curdled on this program, none will be spilt. There's no shooting, knifing, throttling, axing, or poisoning here. No clanking chains, no cobwebs, no bony and or hairy hands appearing from secret panels or better yet bedroom curtains. If it's any part of that dear old phosphorescent foolishness that people who don't like ghost stories don't like, then again, I promise you, we haven't got it. Not tonight. What we do have is a thriller. It's half as good as we think it is. You can call it a shocker. It's already been called a real Orson Welles story. Now, frankly, I don't know what this means. I've been on the air directing and acting in my own shows for quite a while now, and I don't suppose I've done more than half a dozen thrillers in all that time. Honestly, I don't think even that many, but it seems I do have a reputation for the uncanny. Quite possibly a little escapade of mine involving a couple of planets, which shall be nameless, is responsible. Doesn't really matter. Don't think I disapprove of thrillers. I don't. A story doesn't have to appeal to the heart. It can also appeal to the spine. Sometimes you want your heart to be warmed. and Sometimes you want your spine to tingle. The tingling, it's to be hoped, will be quite audible as you listen tonight to The Hitchhiker. That's the name of our story. The Hitchhiker. <laughs> west of Gallup, New Mexico. If I tell it, perhaps it'll help me. Keep me from going, going crazy. I've got to tell this quickly. I'm not crazy now. I feel perfectly well, except that I'm running a slight temperature. My name is Ronald Adams. I'm 36 years of age. Unmarried, tall, dark, with a black mustache. I drive a 1940 Buick license number 6Y175189. I was born in Brooklyn. All this I know. I know that I'm at this moment perfectly sane. That it's not me who's gone mad. It's something else. Something utterly beyond my control. And I've got to speak quickly. At any minute, the link may break. This may be the last thing I ever tell on Earth. The last night I ever see the stars. 6 days ago I left Brooklyn to drive to California. Goodbye, son. Good luck to you, my boy. Goodbye, mother. Here, yeah, give me a kiss. Can I go? I'll come out with you in the car. Oh no, it's raining. Stay here at the door. Oh. <laughs> What's this? Tears? I thought you promised me you wouldn't cry. Oh, I know, dear. I... I'm sorry. But I I do hate to see you. Oh, I'll be back. You've always been on the coast three months. Oh, it isn't that. It's, it's just the trip. Ronald, I wish you weren't drowning. Oh, Mother, there you go again. People do it every day. I know, but you'll be careful, won't you? Promise me you'll be extra careful. Don't fall asleep or drive fast or pick up any strangers on the road. Oh, gosh. I think I was still 17 here. Oh, 
And why? I mean, as soon as you get to Hollywood, won't you, son? Oh, sir, well, don't you worry. It's mainly going to happen. It's just eight days of perfectly simple driving on smooth, decent, civilized roads with a hot dog or a hamburger stand every ten miles. The drive ahead of me, even the loneliness, seemed like a lark. I reckoned without him. Crossing Brooklyn Bridge that morning in the rain, I saw a man leaning against the cables. He seemed to be waiting for a lift. There were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. He was carrying a cheap overnight bag in one hand. He was thin, nondescript, with a cap pulled down over his eyes. I would have forgotten him completely except that just an hour later, while crossing the Pulaski Skyway over the Jersey Flats, I saw him again. At least, he looked like the same person. He was standing now with one thumb pointing west. I couldn't figure out how he got there, but I thought probably one of those fast trucks had picked him up, beat me to the Skyway and let him off. I didn't stop for him. And late that night... I saw him again. It's on the new Pennsylvania turnpike between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh. It's 265 miles long with a very high speed limit. I was just slowing down for one of the tunnels. And I saw him. Standing under an arc light by the side of the road. I seen quite distinctly the bag, the cap, even the spots of fresh rain. They get the lift before the turnpike starts. I mean, you know, just before the toll house. But then it'd be a mighty long ride. Most cars wouldn't want to pick up a guy for that long a ride. And you know, this is pretty lonesome country here. Mountains and woods. You ain't seen anybody like that, have you? Uh, no. Oh, no, not, not at all. I've just... A uh, uh, technical question. I <laughs> see. Well, that'll be just a dollar forty-nine with the tax. <laughs> Gradually passed through my mind a sheer coincidence. I had a good night's sleep in Pittsburgh. I didn't think about the man all next day until... until just outside of Zanesville, Ohio, I saw him again. It's a bright, sunshiny afternoon. The peaceful Ohio fields, brown with the autumn stubble, a greening in the golden light. I was driving slowly, drinking it in, and the road suddenly ended in a detour. In front of the barrier, he was standing. Let me explain about his appearance before I go on. I repeat, there was nothing sinister about him. He was as drab as a mud fence. There was his attitude menacing. He merely stood there, waiting, almost drooping a little, with a cheap overnight bag in his hand. He looked as though he'd been waiting there for hours. And he looked up. He hailed me. He started to walk forward. Hello! Hello! 
Hello? No, uh, not just now. Sorry. Hello to California? No, not today. The other way. Going to New York. Sorry. Picking him up, of having him sit beside me was somehow unbearable. Same time I felt more than ever unspeakably alone. Hour after hour went by. Fields, the towns ticked off one by one. The light changed. I knew now that I was going to see him again. And though I dreaded the sight, I caught myself searching the side of the road, waiting for him to appear. Sandwiches and pop here, don't you? Yeah, we go in the daytime. We're closed up now for the I know, but I was wondering if you could possibly have a cup of coffee, black coffee. Just No, not this time of night, mister. My wife's a coffee, she's a man. Uh, don't shut the door, please. Listen, just a minute ago. Uh, just a minute ago, there was a man standing here, right beside the stand, a suspicious looking man. I, I don't mean to disturb it. And you see, I was driving along when I just happened to look, and there he was. How's he doing? Well, nothing. You've been taking a lift, that's what you've been doing. Now, on your way before I call out care of folks. I got into the car again and drove on slowly. It's getting to hate the car. If I could have found a place to stop, to rest a little. I was in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri now. Few resort places that ever closed, only an occasional log cabin, seemingly deserted. That's all that broke the monotony of the wild, wooded landscape. I had seen him at that roadside stand. I knew I'd see him again. Maybe at the next turn of the road. I knew that when I saw him next, I would run him down. Next afternoon, I stopped a car at a sleepy little junction just across the border into Oklahoma to let a train pass by. When he appeared across the tracks, leaning against a telephone pole, perfectly airless, dry day. The red clay of Oklahoma was baking under the southwestern sun. Yet there were spots of fresh rain on his shoulders. I couldn't stand that. Without thinking, blindly, I started the car across the tracks. He didn't look up at me. He was staring at the ground. I stepped on the gas and car, turning the wheel sharply toward him. I could hear the train in the distance now, but I didn't care. And I went along with the car. The train was coming close. I could hear the bell ringing and the crowd was whistling. Still, he stood there. And now I knew that he was beckoning, beckoning me to my death. Well, I frustrated him that. I started work at last. I managed to back up. And the train passed. He was gone. I was all alone in the hot, dry afternoon. After that, I knew I had to do something. I didn't know who this man was. Or what he wanted of me. I only knew that from now on, I mustn't let myself alone on the road for one minute. Like a ride? Well, what do you think? How far are you going? Oh, uh, where do you want to go? Amarillo, Texas. I'll drive you there. Gee. Uh, mind if I take off my shoes? My dogs are killing me. Go right ahead. 
Oh. Gee, what a break. Have you hitchhiked much? Sure. Only it's tough sometimes in these great open spaces to get the break. Uh, I just think it would be. Though I'll bet you get a good pickup in a fast car. If you did, you could get places faster than, say, another person in another car, wouldn't you? I don't get you. Well, take me, for instance. Suppose I'm I'm driving across the country, say, at a nice steady clip about 45 miles an hour. Uh, couldn't, couldn't a girl like you just standing beside the road waiting for Liz beat me to town? Or any town. Why did she got picked up every time in a car doing from 65 to 70 miles an hour? I don't know. What difference does it make? Oh, no difference. It's just a crazy idea I had sitting here in the car. <laughs> Imagine spending your time in a swell car thinking of things like that. What would you do instead? What would I do? If I was a good-looking fellow like yourself, why, I just enjoy myself every minute of the time. I'd sit back and, and relax. If I saw a good-looking girl along the side of the road. Oh, hey, look out! Did you see me? See who? A man standing beside the barbed wire fence. Oh, I didn't see anybody. I... It wasn't nothing but a bunch of cows and and the wire fence. No? What do you think he was doing? Trying to run into the barbed wire fence? There, I tell you. A thin gray man with an overnight bag in his hand. Well, I, I was trying to run him down. Run him down? Kill him? So you didn't see him back there? You sure? I didn't see a soul. As far as Watch for him the next time. And keep watching your eyes peeled on the road. He'll turn up again. Maybe in a minute. There! Look there! How does this door work? I, I've got knowledge. Did you see him that time? No, I didn't see him that time. And personally, mister, I don't expect never to see him. All I want to do is go on living. I don't see how I will very long, driving with you. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't... I... I don't know what came over me. Please don't go. So if you'll excuse me... You can't go. Listen, how would you like to go to California? I'll drive you to California. See, is Pink Ellison's all the way? No, thanks. Uh-uh, thanks just the same. Listen, please, just, just one minute, please. You know what I think you need, big boy? Not a girlfriend. Just a good dose of sleep. Please. There. I got it now. No, you can't go. Please. Get your back. hands off me. Do you hear me? Get your hands off me. She ran from me. I were a monster. Two minutes later, I saw a passing truck pick her up. I knew then that I was utterly alone. It was in the heart of the great Texas prairies. There wasn't a car on the road after the truck went by. I tried to figure out what to do. I'd get hold of myself. If I could find a place to rest, or even if I could sleep right here in the car for a few hours along the side of the road. I was getting my winter overcoat out of the back seat to use as a blanket when I saw him coming toward me, emerging from the herd of moving steer. Hello! Maybe I should have spoken to him then. Fought it out then and there. For now, he began to be everywhere. Whenever I stopped, even for a moment, for gas, for oil, for a drink of pop, a cup of coffee, sandwich, he was there. I saw him standing outside the auto camp in Amarillo that night when I dared to slow down. I was sitting near the drinking fountain, a little camping spot just inside the border of New Mexico. He was waiting for me outside the Navajo Reservation where I stopped to check my tires. I saw him in Albuquerque when I bought 20 gallons of gas. I was... I was afraid to stop. I began to drive faster and faster. I was... in... in lunar landscape. The great arid Mesa country of New Mexico. I drove through it with the indifference of a fly crawling over the face of the moon. Now he didn't even wait for me to stop. Unless I drove at 85 miles an hour over those endless roads, he waited for me at every other mile. I'd see his figure, shadowless, flitting before me, still in the same attitude, over the cold, lifeless ground, flitting over dried-up rivers, 
over broken stones cast up by old glacial upheavals, flitting in that pure and cloudless air. I was beside myself when I finally reached Gallup, New Mexico this morning. There's an auto camp here. Cold, almost deserted this time of year. I went inside and asked if there was a telephone. I had the feeling that if only I could speak to someone familiar, someone I loved, I could pull myself together. Your call, please. Long distance. Long distance, certainly. This is long distance. I'd like to, uh, <laughs> I'd like to put a, in a call to my home in Brooklyn, New York. I'm Ronald Adams. I'm, uh, the, the number is Beachwood 200828. Certainly. I will try to get it for you. Albuquerque. New York for Gallup. New York. Gallup, New Mexico, calling Beachwood 20828. I read somewhere that love could banish demons. It's the middle of the morning. I knew Mother would be home. I pictured her tall and white haired in her crisp house dress, going about her tasks. Be enough, I thought, just to hear the even calmness of her voice. Will you please deposit three dollars and eighty five cents for the first three minutes? When you have deposited a dollar and a half, will you wait until I have collected the money? All right, deposit another dollar and a half. Will you please deposit the remaining 85 cents? Ready with Brooklyn. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello? Mrs. Adams' residence. Hello. Hello, Mother. This is Mrs. Adams' residence. Who is it you wish to speak to, please? What? Who is this? This is Mrs. Winnie. Mrs. Winnie, I, I don't know any Mrs. Winnie. Is this Beachwood 208828? Yes. Uh, well, where, where's my mother? Where's Mrs. Adams? Mrs. Adams is not at home. She's still in the hospital. The hospital? Yes. Who is this calling, please? Is it a member of the family? Well, what's she in the hospital for? She's been prostrated for five days. Nervous breakdown. But who is this Nervous calling? breakdown? Well, my grandmother never was nervous. It's all taken place since the death of her oldest son, Ronald. Death of her... The death of her oldest son, Ronald? Hey, what's this? What number is this? This is Beechwood 20828. It's all been very sudden. He was killed just six days ago in an automobile accident on the Brooklyn Bridge. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. Your three minutes are up, sir. And so... So I'm sitting here in this deserted auto camp in Gallup, New Mexico. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to get hold of myself. Otherwise, I am going to go crazy. Outside, it's night. The vast, soulless night of New Mexico. A million stars are in the sky. Ahead of me stretch a thousand miles of empty mesa. Mountains. Prairies. Desert. Somewhere among them, 
He's waiting for me. Somewhere I shall know who he is and who I am. So ends The Hitchhiker, and to Orson Welles, our considerable thanks for his playing of the title role. Mr. Welles, help wanted. Men, women, and children. Nature of work, hard, monotonous, back-breaking labor. Hours, 75 a week minimum. Pay, few cents an hour. Added inducement, two meals a day, including several ounces of bad bread and a cup of thin soup. Don't delay. Apply at once. How would you respond to a want ad like that, Mr. and Mrs. American working man and woman? You'd laugh, wouldn't you, and throw the paper in the trash basket. Dismiss the whole advertisement as some kind of a joke. But believe me, it's no joke. It's a simple statement of the working conditions that exist today in Nazi Germany and the conquered countries under Nazi rule. It's also an exact statement of the working conditions that will be imposed on you and every member of your family if the Nazis win this war. You yourself personally can stop them from winning, as you know. You don't have to give up your well-paid job to do it. You needn't have to be a soldier or a sailor or an airman or a nurse or a war worker to ensure American victory. Uncle Sam doesn't ask plain, ordinary, hard-working citizens like you to give him anything. All he asks, all this he does ask very seriously and very urgently, is that you loan him ten cents out of every dollar you make. That's all there is to it. Lend Uncle Sam a dime to win this war. And he'll pay you back with interest when he's won it. The easiest, most convenient way to lend him these dimes is to enroll in the payroll savings plan. Just tell your boss to deduct ten cents from every dollar he pays you and lend it to Uncle Sam in your name. Sign up for this simple savings plan today and when victory comes, you'll have war bonds in your pockets instead of Axis bonds on your wrists. Suspense will be heard again two weeks from tonight. Next Wednesday night, September 9th, the Columbia Broadcasting System will present over many of these stations at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime an address by W. Averill Harriman, the United States Land Lease Administrator in London. Mr. Harriman, as the personal representative of the President of the United States, attended the Moscow conferences between Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. Next Wednesday's broadcast will be Mr. Harriman's first public address since his return to this country. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. John Dietz was our guest director this evening. Tonight's radio drama was written by Lucille Fletcher. The original score was by Bernard Herrmann. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.